Right, good afternoon. Uh, today we're going to have a look at the examination of the back. So once again, uh, it's important to emphasize that we're not only looking at the back, we're looking at the patient as a whole. And uh, you typically start off with a thorough history and uh, thereafter general examination. So assuming we've done that, uh, we will continue uh, by doing the back examination now. Uh, so first of all, uh, although we'd like to stick to the basic principles of look, feel, move and neurovascular examination, uh, it, especially in the examination of the back, it might be cumbersome to have the patient standing and then on the bed and back on his feet again. So uh, we will start off by doing all, everything that we can possibly do uh, whilst the patient is standing. Uh, so first of all, we just like the patient to face us, then we're just going to have a general look at the patient's alignment, uh, whether we can see any pelvic uh, obliquity or any uh, asymmetry or even uh, gross leg length discrepancies. Uh, then one would typically look at the patient from the side. Uh, you'd look for a normal uh, cervical uh, lordosis, uh, thoracic uh, kyphosis and then a lumbar lordosis again. Uh, standing at the back of the patient, uh, you would typically uh, once again look for your alignment, uh, see whether everything is uh, centered nicely and uh, whether there is not maybe any scoliosis or whether one pneumothorax is more prominent than the other. Uh, whilst we have the patient in this position, we're just going to ask the patient to uh, bend forward and uh, demonstrate forward flexion and then we're going to First of all, have a look at uh, the alignment, whether the alignment stays the same uh, or whether one hemothorax becomes more prominent than the other one, uh, as this would be indicative of uh, scoliotic deformity. Uh, then, whilst the patient is in this position, uh, we ask him to forward flex as much as possible, and then we will make a note. So, in this patient, he's uh, almost uh, up to the distal third of the tibia, and this would be a clinical recording that you would make. Uh, so then we get the patient to stand up again, so that was flexion, uh, now we're going to test uh, extension, we ask the patient to uh, look back and arch his back as far back as possible and tell us what he can see. Uh, and if you do this at the fixed uh, point every time, uh, then you can record, say the patient uh, was able to see up until the second light. Uh, thereafter you uh, go to lateral flexion, uh, first starting off towards the left side, you ask the patient to laterally flex and see how far he can go with, the, uh, with his left hand. Uh, and in this case it's uh, say 5 uh, centimeters beyond the fibula head. That's the way you would typically record it. And the same in this way. Uh, it's just important when assessing lateral flexion uh, to see that, they, that it's actually lateral flexion, uh, can we just flex again? Actually lateral flexion that is occurring and uh, not the front flexion because some patients uh, with decreased uh, uh, lateral flexion uh, would sort of try and obscure that by uh, adding some uh, frontal flexion. Alright, uh, while we have the patient like this, uh, we must uh, remember that most of the flexion, uh, the forward flexion uh, originates from the hips. Uh, now one would uh, try to exclude uh, a stiff lower sp uh, or a stiff uh, spine, especially a stiff lumbar spine, uh, as one would see in ankylosing spondylitis by the following test. Now this test is called the Schober's test uh, and typically you would uh, mark two points on his uh, lumbar spine approximately 10 centimeters out of one another. Alright, thereafter you ask the patient to forward flex as far as possible and then you re-measure the distance. And in this case we have 15 and a half centimeters, so you just pass the test. Uh, as one would typically have an elongation of at least 5 centimeters uh, to uh, describe a patient as having normal uh, uh, spinal mobility. Right, you can get up again. Okay, and whilst the patient is on his feet, uh, you would ask him just to uh, walk and observe his gait, see whether there's any short uh, leg gait, any uh, 
any Trendelenburg gait or any uh, gross uh, abnormalities that you see with his uh, gait. Uh, thereafter, we ask the patient to, uh, to lie in a prone position. Uh, what I like to do uh, just to incorporate as many tests as possible in one uh, certain uh, position. I like to ask the patient to bend over the examination table uh, with his uh, lying on his stomach with his hands hanging off that side. Uh, now there are several tests uh, you can do. First of all, you can go ahead and palpate the whole spine, starting at C1 and the ending at the sacrum. It's uh, important to, to palpate the spinous processes. Uh, you can feel for any step uh, as well as any tenderness. Once you've uh, done the spinous processes, you typically go uh, to the paravertebral uh, area uh, and once again compete for any tenderness, any stiffness. Uh, whilst you're in this position, uh, you can start off with your first uh, stretch test, uh, which we call the femoral stretch test, and you ask the patient just to relax and you lift up his leg. Okay. Any, uh, any pain that he has would be indicative of a positive uh, femoral stretch test as in this position you are stretching his uh, femoral nerve. Alright, uh, then you can have the patient uh, stand up again and ask him just to lie uh, supine on the bed. You just turn around on your back. Okay, so once again you want the patient lying uh, nice and square with the square pelvis, pelvis. Uh, and in this position you can uh, you can continue with your nerve stretch test. Uh, in this case, uh, we call it the straight leg uh, raise test. And uh, once you do this, you ask the patient when uh, does he feel the pain and where is the pain. Uh, often patients will complain of pain at the back of their knee, which is basically just hamstrings uh, that are stretching. But if, if he has a, 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 what we call a sciatic type of pain, uh, where it's a lumbar pain or a pain of lumbar origin that shoots down the leg, uh, that would be a positive straight leg test. Then you need to record the angle at which this is, is pain uh, happens, and this will in this case be more or less say 60 degrees. Uh, thereafter, you'd lower the leg by about 10 degrees and dorsiflex the ankle. If the pain recurs, uh, you have a positive LASIK test. Uh, whilst we're busy uh, stretching the sciatic nerve, we can go on to the uh, bowstring test where you have the patient's uh, ankle rest on your shoulder. Then you start off in a flexed position with your thumbs in the popliteal fossa. You uh, try and press the nerve against the uh, knee joint. Then you straighten it out and any pain elicited there will be a positive uh, bowstring test. Whilst the hip is in flexion, uh, you just quickly perform a, a Farber test uh, as a screening test just to uh, ensure there is no hip pathology, as hip pathology uh, might be uh, mimicked by backache. Right, uh, once you've done this, it's important to, especially with, with, uh, with the back examination, to look at your neurovascular structures and uh, even uh, more important, the neurology part of that. Uh, so we're just going to assess the lower limbs uh, for pow power, uh, motive, uh, um, yeah, power sensation and uh, reflexes. So we'll start off by the, uh, with the big toes and asking to, uh, to just uh, dorsiflex them, uh, just lift them towards the roof, okay, and assess the power. There, after you go to your uh, extensors of the toes, you look at ankle dorsiflexion and then you ask them to forcibly plantar flex. With the knees bent, you ask them to extend the knee and on this side once again. Okay, and now you ask them to, to bend his knees so you can uh, test the hamstring function. Bend your knee. Once again. Alright, uh, and then you ask them to lift his leg, his hip, flunk, hip flexion. And this side again. Okay, and this is an alpha patient, so he's got 5 out of 5 power in all his uh, major muscle groups of his lower legs. Uh, thereafter, you can uh, test the sensation uh, and you start basically start off at the hip, uh, working through all your dermatomes towards the feet. 
And then lastly, it's important to elicit the reflexes, uh, which we will be using a reflex hammer. Uh, typically, we look at the uh, ankle reflex. We have the patient cross over like this, and uh, just ask the patient to relax, and then you would uh, give him a gentle tap on his uh, tender Achilles, and contraction there will be noted as a positive reflex. Uh, you basically, when testing reflexes, you have a, a normal reflex, as this patient had just now. Uh, you might have a decreased or no reflex at all, or you might have an increased reflex where you would see a more severe jerk. Uh, then lastly, we ask the patient just to sit on the side of the bed with his feet hanging down, and in this position, you can comfortably test the knee jerk reflex, uh, which is normal in this case. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, whilst the patient is still sitting, uh, you want to test for rotation. Ask the patient to keep his keep his hands like this, and then you ask him to rotate to the one side and then to the other side again. And once again, uh, this will be your axis of rotation. So according to this axis of rotation, uh, you would uh, you would describe the angle. In this case, he has uh, rotation to the left side. To about 45 degrees and on this side once again about 45 degrees thank you